The Bible has a lot to say about the number of firsts in Scripture. For example, in the public ministry of John the Baptist, John, pointing to Jesus and highlighting the Lord Jesus, said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And then when Andrew heard this about Jesus, he followed Jesus. And, you know, the first person he met and reached out to was his own brother, his family. And uh, John 40, 41 says, And he first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found Messiahs, which is being interpreted the Christ, which means Messiah. And as we've been covering now chapters 1 through where we are currently in John chapter 20, we have seen the Lord give us enough information and through his public ministry that either he was the Messiah or you have to say he was a liar. We believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one, chosen of God. But unfortunately for the Jews of Jesus' day, especially those that were part of the Sanhedrin, the idea of Christ being the Messiah, the anointed one, was a stumbling block. And so the Bible tells us he came unto his own, and his own received them not. The Gospel writer also mentions many firsts concerning the miracles of Jesus. Think about when Jesus changed the water into wine, according to John chapter number 2, at the wedding of Cana. And uh, this will be the beginning of the miracles of, of the Lord, and he will manifest his glory. And the Bible says his disciples believed on him. And Jesus taught many firsts in Scripture. For example, in John 10, in verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. In our study, we are now in a point where we have looked over many events. This is Passover week in the Jewish community, in the Scripture, in the context. And Jesus has come to Jerusalem. And many were waving their palm branches. John 12, verse 13 says, They took palm branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And we have looked at how John records for us in that upper room experience, the Lord taught his disciples, his believers, his followers, many wonderful things even by his personal example of humbling himself, washing the feet of the disciples. Then after the upper room experience, how they went to the garden in Gethsemane and then spent some time in prayer. The disciples got a little sleepy there. And then they came, the soldiers came, and the chief priests with their crew, and they arrested Jesus. And he went before Caiaphas, the high priest, and Annas, and then the Sanhedrin, and then he went to Pilate, and then he went to Herod, and then he went back to Pilate, and then Pilate basically caved in to the crowd. Mind you, this is the same crowd that was saying, or at least some of them, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Some of them threw down their clothes, some of them threw down branches, and those would signify some what of an important individual coming into town. Jesus is riding on a coat. This will be the same crowd later on that will be hurling cries of crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. We have looked recently at a number of truths in the scripture where we now see what we are calling the evidence of salva salvation, that is the evidences of the resurrection through the life of Jesus, he was crucified, he was buried, and he rose on the third day. He paid the price of sin. If you recall in John 20, we saw Joseph, Arimathea, and Nicodemus take the body of Jesus, lay the body of Jesus in a tomb. They rolled the stone to cover the tomb. And just as Jesus said, three days later, he would rise from the grave and the first evidence that we looked at in this messages of the resurrection, what are the evidences of resurrection? The first one was the empty tomb. And the second was, was the fact that now 
the Mary and other women that came to the tomb and later some of the disciples, they saw it themselves. The body of Jesus was not there. What is the explanation for that? And so they did not completely understand what was taking place. And we found also that one of the evidences of, of the resurrection was the angels of the Lord and how they had told uh, Mary Magdalene, who said, I know whom you see. You see Jesus, and now he's not here. He's risen, as he said. What would you be thinking if someone buried your loved one, someone that you hunt around, and now the body of the grave is not there any longer? What would be going through your mind? These were in shock. They were somewhat in unbelief that this could happen. And uh, Mary, we understood, she made a beeline to the apostles and uh, they were shocked to hear the news and they ran to the empty tomb and uh, they didn't see the body there. And uh, they saw the gray clothes like Mary, Mary Magdalene and they saw the linen clothes by in that, in that sepulcher, but the body of Jesus was not there. But who comes back to the tomb? It is Mary Magdalene. And today we're going to look at verse number 19, or excuse me, verse number 18. And I really have one particular thought that I want to address in this message in Palm Sunday. Because it leans heavily, I would say, as I look into, into the scripture, the women in the ministry of our Lord were very important. Women in general in Eastern religions, I don't know if you know this, but I would encourage you to research this. How are they treated? How are women treated throughout the world by religions of the world? I submit to you, some are treated very rudely. Some are dominated by males. And, and some are treated in a way we would call very disrespectfully. But in the ministry of our Lord, not so. So as we look at verse 18 of John 20, notice it says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we delve further into the scripture, I pray that you would use it to minister to our hearts. We thank you for, Lord, what we've already covered, and, and we thank you for the fact of the empty tomb, and Lord, how now word has gone out, that your body wasn't there, and how the disciples came to that sepulcher, still in shock and awe, wondering, and Lord, how Mary now has come back to this tomb. Use her testimony. Lord, to minister to our needs. We pray for the Holy Spirit now to guide us into all truth and we'll give you thanks and we'll give you praise for what you do. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. The Lord Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. She becomes, in essence, the first human eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they have heard the angels speak to them they have saw the linen clothes and that can lie in by itself. But now the resurrected Jesus who said, destroy this temple, refer to his body and in three days I will raise it up. Not everybody understood that statement. She is brokenhearted. She didn't see a ghost. She saw him, the Lord Jesus. One that could go right through the wall. As he appeared to those disciples, the stone was not rolled to let Jesus come out of the tomb. The stone, we would say, was rolled away to let others come in to examine what is taking place. Mary was a woman that, like was any one of us, seeking satisfaction, seeking to be happy, seeking to have hope. She met the Lord Jesus. He saved her, forgave her. And now she began to follow him and hear him teach about the wonderful things about the kingdom of God. 
And she's like so many of us, when we lose a loved one, you go back to the cemetery perhaps, may be special days to commemorate the passing of a loved one. In times that we grieve, we reflect upon those we love, and that's exactly the case of this woman. And I think it's significant as we even look here in John 20, when the Lord Jesus shows up back at the sepulcher, there's five ways he cares for this woman, and these are truths that you can implement. And when people doubt your care, this is five ways she, she was ministered. First of all, he was there. He could have been anywhere. He could have been back meeting with those that follow him, that inner disciple, inner group, inner circle of men, Peter, James, and John, as rest of the 11, and he will get to them. But he was at the sepulcher. Secondly, he spoke her name, as we covered in our previous message, Mary, and this was the trigger. Psychologists tell us that perhaps the most important thing you'll ever hear in your life is your name because it identifies you and the things about your life. Thirdly, he provided a safe place. He allowed her still to get emotional. And she was brokenhearted. She tried to hug her. And in, in the text of the King James, he, we, we see that this idea of her trying to cling to him was not to be permanent. And so he says, touch me not, but he allowed her. And then fourthly, he spoke a spiritual truth to her. He said, I must ascend to my father, your God and my God. I think sometimes when we are going through a very dark hour, we just simply need to be reminded of a spiritual tr truth about how much God does care for us. Redemption was at the heart of that statement. And then he affirmed her. That is, when you are down and discouraged, as they all were, sorrowing, what does he do as he cared for her? He affirms her. He tells her, go to the brethren. Gives her an assignment. Sometimes when people are down, we just need to reaffirm to them that they are worth something. They have value. They have dignity. There is something that God has for them. And as we've said so often, God has a plan for all of us. The Bible reminds us that God cares. The Lord Jesus demonstrated his care to, uh, to our dear sister Mary Magdalene. The prophet Isaiah says concerning God's care to us in Isaiah 41 verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Psalm 9 verse 9 and 10 says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. He never forgot about this woman. Psalm 34, verse 17 and 18, the righteous cry, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're not going to suffer hardship, sorrow, tragedies, and heartache, and we could go on. The psalmist said, the righteous cry, and the Lord hear it, and deliver them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Let me emphasize, when your heart is grieving, we believe the Lord weeps with you in a sense. And I want us to consider something this morning, uh, maybe that you have not thought about, and that, that is Jesus honored women in his earthly ministry. He doesn't belittle them. He demonstrated compassion time and time again. He spoke truth and mercy and kindness to them. Going way back to our study in John 2, the first miracle, think about it. Mary, that gave birth to the Lord Jesus, said they have no wine, insinuating this idea. And we don't have all the dialect in the dialogue. I know you're someone different. And he said, woman, my hour is not yet coming. Guess what? 
He changed the water into wine. He honored her in a sense. In John chapter number four, the Lord conversed with a woman of Samaria. He did not treat her as a second class citizen. Though she was living in sin, Jesus treated her with great dignity and care. How about in John chapter number eight, and Jesus could have joined the ranks of those that were ready to kill and stone a woman caught in the very act of adultery. My question is, where was the guy? Why did he get off the hook? And this woman now is about to be put to death by stoning. Instead, Jesus, we would say, defended her by asking a question to the crowd. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone and you could hear the stones begin to drop. Jesus lived in a time when women were oppressed and many religions of the world throughout history have generally mistreated women. And I will again challenge you to go study this out. Remember, it was about two years ago next month in April, this month, excuse me, we are in April, amen? I'm thinking of March. <laughs> when our soldiers deployed out of a country named Afghanistan. One headline read, the U.S. left behind $7 billion with military equipment in Afghanistan in the 2021 withdrawal. Here's one report given by the United Nations Human Rights, March 8, 2023. Since the takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban in August of 2021, Women have been wholly excluded from public office and the judiciary. Today, Afghanistan's women and girls are required to adhere to a strict dress code and are not permitted to travel more than 70, 75 kilometers. That will be about 46 miles without a mahong. That will be someone that will, you could legally marry like a cousin, an uncle. They are compelled to stay at home. What's driving that? I submit to you, it's religion. It's oppressive in some states. On the other hand, Christianity is completely different. Jesus is our role model. He taught us to honor women. In Galatians chapter number three, what is God's viewpoint of guys and girls, male and female? Paul tells us this in Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there bond nor free, neither is there male or female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. In other words, when you look at the body of Christ, no one has a dibs because they are male. No one has the dibs or the priority because they are female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 2, verse 11 we're told, for there is no respect of persons with God. The testimony of Scripture is that God has exalted women in everyday life. Think about it in the New Testament. If any of you guys are married, the Bible tells us, likewise, your husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Honor means value. Honor means esteem, to have respect for. Not that women are weaker physically. I've met some women at Walmart that I would not dare get in a tangle with, okay? <laughs> or weaker in the sense they're emotional, they're very sensitive. And my, oh my, I haven't learned this lesson, brother, and maybe you have. But it's not what you say, it's how you say it, amen? Amen. When I get to glory, I won't have to worry about those things. But here I need to continue to submit myself to the truth of the word of God. Robert Mayer said this, human rights rest on human dignity. Someone stated, death with dignity is better than life with humiliation. I want us just for a moment in this message this morning, I want you to look in the first book of the New Testament, the, the Gospel of Matthew. I want you to see in Matthew chapter number one what the Lord does concerning women. When you read the genealogies, and that's what I'm going to refer you to in verses one, two, three here, what it is is a compilation of men with their sons and how people were related 
brought into this world. But the verses I'm going to show you have four women. In Matthew chapter number one, it says, The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Pharaoh and Zamar of Thamar. Pharaoh begot Ephraim, and Ephraim begot Abraham. Now, who is this? Who is this woman in verse 3, Thamar? He's talking about Tamar. You know who she was? She was a woman that prostituted herself to seduce Judah because of his oppression towards her. You can read all about it in Genesis 38, verse 24, but here she is in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. Skip down to verse number five. And Solomon begat Boaz of who? Rahab, Rachel. Who is Rachel? That's another word for Rahab. She was a Canaanite prostitute living in Jericho. Later in verse five, it says, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Who's Ruth? Ruth was at one time a idol worshiping Moabite. And the Moabites were pagans who worshiped the God of Chemosh. And they were under the curse of God. Ruth is in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number six. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of Ur, that had been the wife of Urias. Who was the wife of Urias? Bathsheba. That well-known individual that had an affair with King David. And out of their relationship, Solomon was born. I'm simply pointing those names out. Four women. The Lord doesn't discredit them. Rather, he elevates them because they are the genealogy of our Lord and our Savior. What is God saying to us through these truths? What is he telling us in the New Testament? God is, in a real sense, giving us a message of grace. Grace is a merit of favor. A message of grace that extends both to men and women. But in specifics, we find Mary Magdalene, the first woman to be able to see the Lord Jesus, the first eyewitness, humanly speaking, of the resurrected Lord. She's in a very prominent position as far as scripture is concerned. Someone stated this Christianity is the only legitimate woman's liberation movement. Can I get a witness? Why is that? Because in Christ, there is no respecter of persons. Because the Christ of the Bible has regard, has respect for women of the world. Mary Magdalene is given the blessing and honor of being the first eyewitness of the resurrection. This was a lady with a former dark lifestyle. So dark that as we talk in a recent message or two, that the Lord Jesus cast out seven demons out of the woman that we know as Mary Magdalene. Can you imagine what the Jewish leaders of Judaism thought of this woman as she was going back and, and will become a potential spokesman, a witness of the resurrected Savior? They would probably condemn her because of her lifestyle. But the Lord didn't do so. We have the recorded testimony that this woman was there at the tomb. And so let me just close by saying, and, and the message today is not that long, but I just want to give this much to a woman. And we have shared some truths concerning Mary Magdalene and how she went back to John and Peter. And we're going to find even later on tonight as we find more evidences of the resurrection that they did not believe her. They went and, and they came and they looked at the tomb and she goes back to the tomb. She's brokenhearted. And Jesus could have been anywhere, shows up, cares for her, allows her to have a safe place, if you please, calls her by name. 
affirms her. Go tell the brethren. And the Bible tells us in this passage, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. In closing, what does this mean? First of all, it reminds us all, Jesus is alive, amen? amen? We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. He's alive. He's in our lives through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. He promised the Holy Spirit of God according to the Word of God as we studied in John 14 and many other passages. It, mean, it means that the Lord keeps His promises. You can believe the Scripture this Bible is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. While the world is not too sure on the financial market, the world front concerning who are we going to get in a tangle with. I know the situation in Afghanistan is still unfolding. The name China keeps coming up. The name Russia keeps coming up. The word of God is proving over and over again the Lord Jesus will come Isaiah said he will come like a lamb who would be led to the slaughter, who would open not his mouth. That was depicting, prophesying the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is standing before Mary, living, breathing, the resurrected Savior. What does this mean? It means death and the grave were conquered. Yesterday I was at a funeral in the morning. And uh, our condolences go out to those families that have lost a loved one. But as I stood by the graveside and shared our condolences with those loved ones, there were many there, and I would say a majority of them, that grieve without hope. We as Christians, we grieve with hope because we believe the Bible tells us that because of Jesus and his work on the cross of Calvary and his atoning work, being buried and rising on the third day. The resurrection is a reminder that God was satisfied with the payment of Jesus on the cross. Because he lives, we shall live also. We will join together our loved ones in glory. Death and grave were conquered. It also means that all of our sins can be forgiven. Every single one of them. Isn't this what we want? Isn't this the centerpiece of our heart's desire? We want to be accepted for who we are. And the God, the creator of the world, has sent heaven's best so that we could be forgiven, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That song we sang earlier, say by the blood of the crucified one, that precious blood was poured out, spilt for us, that all of our sins, past, present, and future, could be forgiven. And then as I think of Jesus standing before Mary Magdalene, what does it mean? It means everyone, including women, matter to God. There's a lot of confusion in the world today, and I won't go down that particular thought, but you know, when you think about what the Bible says, you and I are made in the image, in the likeness of God. Now, wrap that around your head. Every person you meet today, this week, no matter if they look different than you, no matter if they're not from here, wherever they are, they are made in the image of God. Therefore, why would we even think less of an individual? Women matter to God. And then as I think of Jesus standing here at the sepulcher, what does this mean? It means God cares when you're hurting. He may not change the situation. Think about the thief on the cross, and we addressed this a while back in one of the messages. The thief, the Lord didn't heal him. The Lord didn't change his situation, but he saved his soul. And he believed, the thief believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is not a matter of what we do. It's who we do believe. If we believe in the resurrected Christ, then we can hang on the promise 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Then it means for us, we would say, not only that God cares when we're hurting women, matter to God, your sins can be forgiven, the grave and death are conquered, you can believe the scripture and Jesus is alive. But when you come to that final moment that you take your last breath, you will continue to live on. Everybody lives on. And everybody will have a resurrection. As according to John chapter number five, we spend a lot of time, some will be resurrected to life. Bodies go in the grave. As I understand it, when someone dies, either they can have their body cremated, turned into dust, or you can have your body frozen like a frozen popsicle. Or people traditionally have their body laid in the grave, six feet under. All the cemeteries in the world are a testimony that all of us have sinned. Death is 100% proof. All of us will pass off to sin unless the rapture takes place. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. And according to John's account in the book of Revelation, which we will get to in our series on, on Wednesday nights, death is not the end. You will have a resurrection. The difference is, will you be resurrected to life? Will your body be joined to your soul, your spirit in eternity in the presence of Jesus? Or will your body be joined to your spirit, your soul, and be separated from God forever in the lake of fire. I can have hope, you can have hope when I take my last breath if the rapture does not take place because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Because the resurrection hope when the time should come for the Lord to take me home, my faith, my trust is in one that loved me, has promised to be faithful to me throughout all my days. And so this morning's message is a little bit different in the fact that I felt like, and I was really burdened about this as I got into a lot of material, and you're just getting a little bit of it, but when I think about Mary Magdalene, my oh my, what, what an opportunity what, what a tremendous grace that was demonstrated and to challenge us to think how the Lord thinks. And not just here, but throughout the word of God. And, and there are many other references that I could make reference to as how the Lord God treats women. So we thank God for our women, amen? amen. And if you got a mom in the house, pray for your mom, honor her and encourage her. Encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can all have resurrection hope. 